Wow. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you for being here today. By the way, uh, uh, it was mentioned in the uh, welcome announcement video, but if you're not following along with the Advent reading plan, uh, in all reality, it's an Advent uh, video plan uh, that Justin and Palmer, two guys on our staff, created uh, with about 25 people from our church uh, that are sharing uh, these devotions, and they are outstanding. And today, Kim, who was singing with Shannon, uh, Kim is the one leading the devotion, and it happens to be uh, on the story that we're going to be sharing uh, with you guys today. So highly, highly encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, last week, Pastor Chris kicked off our Christmas sermon series, uh, The Stories They Could Tell. Obviously, we have some of the story written in the Bible for us, but there's probably so much more that they could have talked about. And we looked at Joseph, who was the earthly father to the Son of God, who was called to trust beyond really understanding. And one of our uh, scriptures in Advent was that, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, to trust in the Lord with all of your heart, to lean not in your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path obvious. He'll, he'll make it straight. And really, that was the call to Joseph. Now, when you see the title of the sermon series, The Stories They Could Tell, Christmas is about a story, a singular story, the birth of Jesus, the story of the Son of God leaving heaven and being born here on earth as a man. But that story didn't just impact the stories back then, nor does it just impact the stories of today. By God's great design. That singular story continues to impact us generation to generation. So today, if you have a Bible, I'm going to ask that you take those out or turn those on, whatever is most convenient for you, to Luke chapter 1, uh, the gospel according to Luke, the very first chapter as we read the Christmas story this morning. By the way, um, so that you can go ahead and start planning, regardless of Who's going to be with you on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? Really would encourage you, uh, begin that day before you open a single present. Uh, read the Christmas story, and this would be a great part for you to read. So if you would do me a favor, if you're physically able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now, Elizabeth was married to one of the priests, right? Uh, Elizabeth and Mary are actually relatives. So just so context, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. 
For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Let's pray together. Father, today as we tell the story of Mary, God, I pray that just like we did last week with Joseph, somehow, some way, uh, we could put ourselves in her shoes as the story is being told. Lord, we think about Joseph and the incredible trust, the trust beyond his understanding. And Lord, we think about Mary and the faith that she had. So Lord, today, would, would you increase our faith? God, our trust in you, our love of you. And Lord, we pray now that your Holy Spirit would take your holy scriptures and Lord would speak to us. And Lord, help us to hear even the stillness of your voice this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. You know, a lot of times when we read the stories of men and women of the Bible, many times we think, well, they were just super talented, or they had this super faith that none of us today could have, or possibly we think, well, they were just so intelligent, or they were so influential, of course God could use them. But 1 Corinthians 1.27 tells us that's not the case At all. Matter of fact, it is a lot of times the meek and the misunderstood and the misfortunate, even the foolish things of this world that God uses to accomplish His mission. So if you fall into that category, then you are like the men and the women of the Bible that God used. Uh, Luke, the doctor who is writing this account of the gospel, Luke loved to pair people together in his gospel. He, he made sure to tell not just one of their stories, but both of their stories. He just loved to do that. So over the last several weeks, as we were preparing to tell the story of Mary, I've got to be honest with you, I was really struggling. Like, how am I going to put myself in Mary's shoes and share her story? So this morning, I've asked our uh, communications director and really a a student of God's word, Bree, that if Bree would come out and help us. Uh, So for the next few minutes, she's going to share Tell Mary's story from her perspective. So would you guys welcome Bree as she comes out this morning? So when we first meet Mary, she's just a young girl. Most scholars think she was around 16 to 18 years old, and she's engaged to Joseph. Um, This is a really exciting time in her life, full of anticipation. Engagement back then wasn't what we think of it today. It was more of a legal binding contract between two people, and in order to break it, they would need to be divorced. So everyone in their small town already considered them to be husband and wife, but they weren't living together yet, and they hadn't slept together. This engagement period usually lasted around six to 12 months, and it would end with a wedding feast where they would celebrate, and then Mary and Joseph would go to the house that Joseph had built for them. So everything happening in Luke's 1 and 2 is happening against this backdrop. So imagine this. Mary's at home with her parents, and she's likely planning her wedding, daydreaming about what decorations they'd have, what food they'd serve, and who they'd invite. She's preparing to walk down the aisle towards Joseph in her wedding dress and begin the rest of their lives. When all of a sudden, God interrupts everything. God sent an angel named Gabriel to give a message to Mary a message that would change her life forever and eventually ours. It's the kind of moment that can leave you stunned. One minute, your life's going smooth and perfect, and the next, it's entirely flipped upside down. Have you ever been there? Um, A few years ago, the Lord called me to leave Birmingham, where I was comfortable and life made sense, and move here, a place where I had no family, very few connections, and for a job where I felt underqualified. And if you know me at all, you know that I am a bit of a planner, and I'm not much of a risk taker. And so all of this didn't make sense to me. I like when things are logical and perfectly planned and all the details come together. Yet in this season of uncertainty, I felt nothing but peace. I knew that God wanted me in this place for this season and this time. I trusted him. 
Sure, all of the questions were still racing through my head. I'm sure my mom, who received all the phone calls, could tell you. But they paled in comparison to the supernatural peace that I felt about my decision. God indeed does provide a peace that surpasses all understanding. And that's where I think we find Mary today. The angel's message is as big as it gets. Mary, God has chosen you to give birth to his son. And she's not filled with doubt, but honest confusion. How can this be? I think you've got the wrong girl because what you just said is impossible. It wasn't that she didn't trust God, it's that it just didn't make sense. It wasn't logical. She wasn't married yet, and she hadn't done anything to lead to pregnancy. From her perspective, and if we're being honest, from ours, it was impossible. But here's what makes Mary so remarkable, her faith. She trusted God even though it didn't make sense. Instead, of, she said something like, okay, I'll do it, I'll be a part of God's plan, but you're going to have to explain to me how this is gonna work because it makes no sense to me. Real faith is believing God for the impossible, even when it doesn't make sense and we don't have all the answers. Real faith is trusting God in the midst of uncertainty and believing for a miracle, even when the facts butt up against it. In this part of the story, Mary believed God, and he, she believed that this was true. She just didn't know how it was going to happen. So once again, God sent Gabriel to reassure Mary that his spirit would come upon her and it would overshadow her. The word used here means to dwell or to pitch a tent or to tabernacle. It's the same word describing God's presence with the Israelites in the wilderness and in the temple and with us here today. This is the same word used to describe the Holy Spirit dwelling in Mary. This wasn't gonna happen in an ordinary way. It was divine, it was miraculous. She would carry and give birth to the Son of God. Even with this explanation, I can't help but stop and think about what must be racing through Mary's mind. How in the world am I gonna explain this to Joseph? Will he ever believe me? And then there's my reputation. How, how am I gonna tell my mom? What are these people gonna say? What are the rumors that are gonna be spreading around? In the honor-shame culture of the East, Mary's reputation was everything. There were real consequences for breaking social rules. By saying yes to God, Mary knew that she was opening herself up to gossip, judgment, and shame, not just for herself, but for her family and for Joseph too. Can you picture the whispers around Nazareth? Did you hear what happened to Mary? She's pregnant, and it's not even Joseph's baby. Do you think he's gonna leave her? Mary knew all of this. She knew what saying yes would cost her, but she still did it. She put God's plan above her own comfort, her dreams, and her reputation. She was willing to trust him even when it didn't make sense. And that's what real faith is. Real faith is saying, God, I don't know how this is gonna work out, but I'm choosing to trust you in this moment. It's believing God can do the impossible even when you don't have all the answers. See, Mary's story reminds us that in the midst of uncertainty, faith doesn't mean the absence of questions, it means trusting God in the middle of them. So as you picture Mary in this moment, remember this, she wasn't just saying yes to being the mother of Jesus, she was saying no to herself. She was surrendering her dreams, her plans, and her comfort to be a part of something so much bigger and better than herself. And that's why in the midst of uncertainty, God found her faithful. And so this morning, may we echo the same words that Mary spoke in our own lives over our own situations. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Wow, thank you, Bree. Uh, that is the third time already I've heard that, and I don't know why. There's just something about hearing um, a, a young lady who loves the Lord share about a young lady who loved the Lord. And uh, first of all, just I am so thankful uh, for the young men and women in our church uh, that are passionately uh, pursuing after Christ the way that Bree does, the way that Mary and Joseph did. You know, Bree mentioned several times the faithfulness of Mary. So this morning, uh, I want to share with you three ways when I soaked this text, uh, three of the ways that I found Mary being faithful. The first one is this, Mary was faithful in her waiting. You know, most of us are not very good waiters, and I don't mean serving at a restaurant or maybe even in your home. I mean just the simple fact of having to wait 
for something. Those of you who are parents, uh, probably already your kids are asking, can we open just one gift, right? And, on, and by the way, that's just going to increase, right? The intensity is just going to pick up the closer we get to Christmas Day. And so Mary was faithful in her waiting. Look in verse 26 of Luke 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel, if you highlight, underline in your Bible, to Nazareth. By the way, the only other reference you may have of Nazareth is later on in Jesus' ministry. Someone says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Like, what good thing can come from there, right? If a Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. So imagine just for a moment that you're Gabriel, and you know that one day you're going to go to the holy city. You're going to go to the holy temple, and you get the great fortune of telling Zechariah that, that Elizabeth is with child and you guys are going to have the forerunner to the birth of Jesus. Gabriel has been waiting for this announcement. And then the Lord says, oh, by the way, after your visit to the holy city, to the holy temple, I'm going to ask you to go to Nazareth. I'm thinking Gabriel must have put it in Google Maps. and like, it doesn't even show up. Like, how am I supposed to get to Nazareth? Where in the world is that place? Uh, Nazareth was this small town about five and a half, six miles out of Jerusalem. They say that only about two to 300 people lived there during this time. It was known as a poor and lowly city. And yet in this small town, we find the faithfulness of a young lady named Mary. You know, I think what's so important in that thought is Mary is a good reminder that your standing with God is not achieved through your stature or your status, but through a surrendered life, regardless of your age, your circumstances, and even your location. And in verse 27, Mary was there, and she was a virgin who's pledged to be married. And I thought Bree did a great job of helping you understand that. I'll put it a little bit more into its context. Pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So to go back in that culture, in that time, that society, I, I want to share just a little bit of the background of what does it mean pledged to be married. We don't do it this way anymore, but I'm not so sure it might not have been the better way to have done it. Uh, Joseph's dad would have made the journey with Joseph, and they would have come to uh, Mary's home where they would have encountered Mary, but more importantly, Mary's father. And Joseph's dad and Mary's dad would have had a conversation, and Joseph's dad would have said something like this, I have three French hens, two turtle doves, a partridge, and a pear tree. What do you think? And that's a different story. That that would not at all have been what he would have said. He would have said something like this. Uh, how, how many goats and camels is it going to cost for us to come up with an, an acceptable arrangement for my son and your daughter to be engaged, to be married? That's how they would have done it in that day. And I understand we don't do it like that today, but like I said, in America alone, the divorce rate right now is 54%. 54%. So I'm not so certain that this wasn't a better way. Uh, and if their agreement would have happened, here's what would have happened next. Joseph and his father would have left. They technically, as Bree said, would have been married. A divorce certificate would have had to have ended that agreement. But Joseph and his father would have gone away, sometimes for six months, maybe nine months, even up to a year. But during that waiting, Joseph would begin to build their room attached to the family 
home. So he would start preparing a place for Mary to come and live as his wife. And once that place was acceptable, the father would be the one to tell the son, you may now go get your bride. The room you built is complete. And then the son, in this case Joseph, he would have sent a forerunner. So he would have sent like his best man in the wedding. Go tell everyone the wedding feast is about to happen. So the forerunner would have gone ahead of him sharing the news. Joseph is coming. The wedding is about to happen. And then, of course, when Joseph arrived, arrived, they would have this wedding together. But think about this. Truly, it was only the father who would know when the wedding feast would happen. Now, keep that in mind, that tradition, that practice, that picture, when you hear the words that many of you have heard at so many funerals over the course of your life. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 14, 1 and 4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And then the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 36. But about the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven. And then Jesus says, nor the Son, meaning himself, but only who? The Father. Don't you love when the Bible comes together like that? When we see this beautiful picture of Jesus living his life here, dying, resurrected, ascending into heaven to do what? To work on our room. And one day, the father's going to say, hey, son, go get your bride. The room is ready. I just love the text that we have before us. You know, uh, Bree mentioned when Mary discovered that she was pregnant, her mind must have eventually wondered and thought about the social implications of her pregnancy. Now, here's what we know. Uh, Joseph thought about it. Pastor Chris last week mentioned that Joseph seriously thought about divorcing secretly Mary when he found out that she was pregnant and he knew there was no way the baby could be his. So if Joseph was thinking about the social implications, I think it's safe to assume that Mary was probably under the same pressure. But what about us? I mean, we talk about peer pressure to our kids, but I have discovered as a pastor for many years that peer pressure really doesn't go away. There's always these social implications that a lot of times we struggle with. Am I going to trust God with a surrendered life, or am I going to, am I going to be more worried about socially what people are saying and thinking of me? So I think this thing of peer pressure really never goes away. Until we decide that it's not going to be peer pressure that drives our life, but it's going to be the Lord who's going to derive our life. Yet despite the pressures, we must and we see that Mary felt that, and yet she remained faithful in her waiting. You know, waiting is difficult because it's in this season of waiting that most of us realize we don't know what's going to happen next. It's in this season of waiting when we realize we don't know what's going on. It's in this season of waiting when we realize ultimately we're not in control. And for a lot of us, maybe even some of you who would describe yourself as a control freak, waiting is really really difficult. It's in the waiting the reason we doubt, because we don't know. 
It's in the waiting is the reason we worry because we simply don't know. It's the reason we're anxious a lot of times because we don't know. It's this season of waiting and yet what we find is in this season of waiting, this season of unknown, Mary stayed faithful to the Lord. Hey, are you in a season like that right now? This season where maybe you feel like the Lord has called you to do something, is asking you to do something, and and maybe like Mary, you can't figure it out in your head. Maybe you don't even figure it out in your heart. It's a season of waiting, and yet you're going to remain faithful by taking God at his word and trusting him. The second way that I saw Mary being faithful was in her obedience. Verse 28 says this, the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And by the way, just kind of an afterthought, um, you too can be highly favored. Like this isn't just something Mary experienced, that you can experience the favor of God, that God's blessing And favor is on your life. And it happens when we live a faithful life. So Mary had lived really an unidentified life. And I think it's a life she really enjoyed. A life where no one knew her name. She was never asked to speak from the stage. She uh, did not do the welcome or the announcement video. She did not sing in front of the congregation. Mary would have been someone who would have worked behind the scenes and wanted to be behind the scenes. She had lived a pretty unidentified life, and she was following God, doing everything he called her to do. She loved God with all of her heart, but no one noticed. But God did. God noticed. And and many of you are like Mary in that regard, that you love the Lord with everything inside of you. You serve him. You just don't want to be on a stage. You don't want your face on a video. You don't want the spotlight on you. You love serving behind the scenes. But even serving behind the scenes, you may wonder, does anyone notice? And can I reassure you today, God notices. Like God notices those things that you do when no one else is paying attention. I I would say to that mom who stays up late with that newborn and wakes up early and, and, and finally is ready to go out on a date only to have to go change clothes because of a spit up. And, and maybe that mom is like, God, do you even notice me? And I just want you to know today, God notices. Or maybe it's you as an employee who works really hard and, and, and maybe you're the first one to leave, the, the, the first one to arrive and the, the last one to leave. And, and maybe you're helping your colleagues to, to cover some of their work and, and you're doing that and yet you don't get the raise and maybe you get passed over for the promotion. And maybe you want, God, do you even notice? Can I just tell you today? God notices. Like God notices your faithfulness in your obedience to serve him and not to serve men. And so I just want to tell you as a pastor, so many of you serve in so many different areas of our church, and many of you, again, do not want anyone to know, but you use your gifts, your talents, your skills every Sunday, and many of you would say, it's just a small thing, but I want you to know. It makes a huge impact here at STF, but it also makes a huge impact in our community. And I also want you to know, God notices. So let's pick back up in verse 29 through 31. Mary was greatly troubled at the words of Gabriel and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus, which, by the way, just means Yahweh saves. And now listen to the angel's description of Jesus found in verse 32. He will be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, 
And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Every kingdom comes to an end except for Jesus'. That's one of the things I love about being a follower of Christ. You're on the winning side. Like you're on the winning team. And how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? You know, Mary probably had, as Bree mentioned, a lot of questions running through her mind. Probably the same time when the Lord speaks to you and maybe asks you to do something and you have a gazillion questions running through your head and running through your heart and you're wondering, how in the world, well, God, why would you choose me? Of all the people in the world, God, there are so many other people that you could choose. And yet God, because you've been found faithful... God has chosen to use you in a certain situation. And Mary, even though she had these questions, she did not ask the question of if it would happen, but only how would it happen. And many of us have done it. God, how in the world are you going to take someone like me and use me in a way that could bring honor and glory to your name? Well, Luke 1, 35 says this. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Then verse 38 says this. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. And so when the angel told Mary that her world was going to be turned upside down, I loved how she responded. I'm the Lord's servant. Man, what an amazing title for you to get to wear. You know, a lot of times when you are traveling and you sit next to someone who you've never met before, the first question is always, what's your name? And that's normally followed by, where do you live or what do you if you ever wanted to know what Mary did, her answer is so simple and clear. I'm just a servant of the Lord. Wow, if maybe we could change our Twitter heading or our Facebook post of who, what do we do? I'm just a servant of the Lord. What do you do? Anything the Lord asks me to do. That's just what I do because that's who I am. I think it's safe to say that this is one of the greatest statements of faith in the entire Bible. I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. And with those words, Christ and Christmas were born. You know, wonder what the Lord is waiting on in your life for you to say yes. Lord, with a surrendered life, I am your servant. Do to me whatever you please. And I wonder in that response, if the Lord is just waiting to, through you, bring about maybe not Christmas, but to bring about change in our world for his good and for his glory. Now, did Mary's heart skip a beat? I, I think so. Um, did Mary get nervous? I believe so. See, questioning, but not afraid. Wondering, but not terrified. Unsure, but not uncertain. You know, finally, I think what we find here is not only was Mary faithful in the beginning, Mary was faithful all the way through. So Mary was faithful in her devotion. Mary wasn't just the earthly mother to Jesus when he was born, but Mary was a faithful mother to Jesus even until he died. Mary was devoted to Jesus at his birth and at his death. Mary wasn't just the mother of Jesus. You need to understand, Mary was also a follower of Jesus. And the source of Mary's faith was her son. Because Mary treasured these things in her heart, the announcement that the angel Gabriel made to her. And so Mary knew that, yes, I'm the earthly mother of Jesus. 
But Jesus is God the Son who would leave heaven, come to this earth, live a sinless life, and yet allow himself to take on the punishment of sin, to, to even become sin on our behalf so that you and I could have a relationship with God the Father provided by an introduction from God the Son. And Mary was devoted to that. Mary's devotion didn't waver as a follower of Jesus. She believed in Him, trusted in Him, followed Him all the way to the cross. And then three days later, once again, Mary was able to see God do the impossible because the impossible became possible as on the third day Jesus rose from the dead, overcoming and defeating sin, shame, the evil one, this world in which we live. Jesus is victorious. And Luke 2, 19 says this, Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart. And often she thought about them. I bet she did. Hey, this season of Advent of hope, here's hope. Jesus loves you. There's hope in that. Would you treasure those sayings in your heart today? Would you allow the scripture that we just read, the story that Mary tells, for you to remain faithful. Trust God for the impossible. And know this. Here's hope. Jesus cares for you. You know, the story goes, did Mary know? Great debate. I think she did. I think Mary knew that God was going to deliver her through the child she would deliver. Let's pray together. Father, I pray for our own faith. Lord, so many times we can get distracted. So many times, Lord, we can even get discouraged. God, so many times uh, our faith can get off track. Lord, so many times we can all of a sudden start putting faith in other things. Maybe in our own abilities or our finances, the job we have, the home we live, the family we're a part of. Yet, God, we know that we have to keep as the object and the center of our faith, your son Jesus. And so Lord, I pray that even through Mary's story and how you found her faithful, God, that you would find us faithful as well. That Lord, we would take these things that we learn in church, that time we spend alone with you, maybe early in the morning, in the middle of the day, late at night, and God, we would treasure those things. We would hold on to them. And Lord, we would too would live a life of faith. God, we are your servant. Would you do to us as your word is spoken? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.